All right, glad to be back with you guys. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, whether you have a physical Bible or whether to look along, follow along on your phone on the Bible app, we encourage you to do that. Philippians chapter 3 today, it is good to be with you. I told someone, I was telling the group earlier that yesterday was the first time in two weeks that I'd put on anything other than sweatpants. We've been fighting COVID at our house Started with my wife and my daughter, and then uh, when she was getting better, and then all of a sudden my son and I, so our whole family, has had our way through at least this variant of it, and so we're glad to have that behind us. We're glad to be back with you. I know that there are a number of people who, for various reasons, whether you're, you've been exposed or whether you uh, um, are concerned about being exposed, and maybe you're worshiping from home, or we'll watch this later, and we welcome you as well. Philippians 3, it is good to be back in worship this morning. I was uh, sharing with our group of volunteers, we gather and we pray before service on Sunday. We pray for you and pray that God will use us as we serve you and serve him together. And I was telling them that I needed to be with God's people today. Like I needed the worship. I was ready to be back with you. And I love when we worship. I love when we have uh, times when, when it's clear that people are engaged, when I can hear you singing, when I can, we can sense that God is at work. I love the, the quiet moments, but also I love the celebrative songs. I love when we clap along, but I, I've discovered something that when we sing songs are up-tempo and when we clap, there are some people that get, um, they get outed. There are some people that uh, are suddenly exposed, right? Because we discover that there are some people that are just rhythmically challenged, aren't they? You ever stood next to somebody who just cannot clap to the beat for, to save their life? Like they are enthusiastic. They love Jesus. They're all about it. They're into it. But they are nowhere near being in rhythm with anybody else. And if you've ever done that, it's, it's challenging. You may not have ever stood next to that person because maybe you are that person. Anybody in the room who would just own and say, just in, in, before God and before your friends, hey, that's me. I can't, I can't clap to be. Okay, several of us. Yeah, that's okay. And I appreciate it. You, you often still do it with enthusiasm and with passion. But if you've ever seen somebody who dances offbeat or who claps offbeat, if you've ever heard someone singing offbeat where they're like a few, a little bit behind or a little bit ahead, it is very off-putting. Some people are just rhythmically challenged. Well, a lot of us, and think all of us, fight with the temptation to be rhythmically challenged when it comes to walking or living in the rhythms that God has established for our lives. A rhythm has been defined by some as, or at least by the dictionary, as a regular repeated pattern of movement or sound. And it's clear both from our lives and from what we see in, in creation and in what we find in God's Word that God has created us to live within, to to, to be led by, to, to live within certain rhythms in our lives, certain habits, certain patterns that we develop. We see, this, we see this, for example, in the life of Jesus. Jesus is fully God, holy, righteous, perfect in all of his ways. And yet here was one who set apart time, a part of the rhythm of the life of Jesus in the short time he was here on earth, was to set aside time to pray was a set-aside quiet time to hear from the Father, to make sure that his actions, his choices, his words, his behaviors, his, that all that he was doing was in keeping with and consistent with and for the glory of the Father. His was a, a natural rhythm of time with the Father. He is a model for us. God has created us, we believe, I believe, God has shaped us in such a way that we need a regular pattern, a habit, a rhythm, if you will, in our lives. If we are to walk in step with God's beat of God's rhythm for us, we, we need regular times with God in his word and in prayer. Now, it's not, it's not that those disciplines in themselves change us. It is that by engaging in those, we are connecting ourselves to the work of God in and through our lives. We, we are getting in the flow, if you will, of the, of the work of God's grace. We are opening up our hearts to say, God, speak to me, work in me, show me, transform me to make me after your image and after your likeness and for your glory. This is a rhythm that helps us to grow and mature in him. And so here at the outset of 2022, we had hoped to start last week, but we got postponed. So starting today, what we want to do is to try to encourage one another to early on this year to establish a rhythm of daily time with the Lord. 
And that may look a little bit different from person to person, but we, we want you. Some of you have this habit. You have developed this pattern in your life. Maybe there was a time for some of you when you had that pattern, but somehow it's not there anymore. Or maybe, or, or maybe there's just some renewal. Maybe you've been doing it, but maybe it just needs, you need a fresh um, sense of why you do what you do and, there, and a heart behind it. Not just going through the motions, but to genuinely seek God. And so that's what we really want to do over the next several weeks is to encourage one another to engage in an establishment of a rhythm of a regular time with God, specifically in his word and in prayer on a daily basis. Now, to help do that, we've shared this a few weeks before, trying to build up toward this. We're going to utilize, we're going to encourage you to utilize this resource written by our own uh, associate, uh, senior associate pastor, Eddie Rasnick, called How to Develop a Quiet Time. And these are, these are available at our cost at $10 a piece at the Information Hub. We encourage you to pick one up after the service but in this, this uh, sort of a 40-day journey, which is there's something biblical about that, but also it's long enough to establish a, a new habit or pattern or rhythm in our lives. And, and in the study, Eddie uh, shares sort of a daily devotional, a daily study, a daily truth from God's Word, and daily prompts in prayer. And so we want to encourage you to maybe utilize that as a, as a tool to help you. But, but imagine what it would be like for your life and for us as the church if collectively we were to establish these rhythms of this daily time with God, listening to hear from God, sharing our hearts with God, building our relationship with God. Imagine the impact that could have in your life and in our body and in the world around us through our lives for his glory. That's our goal. Well, in the study, Eddie speaks of six ingredients or six principles or six uh, things that are, are truths, realities that are helpful if we're going to have healthy rhythms of these times with God on a daily basis. And the first of those we're going to look at today, which I think is the, really the, it's the heart behind, it's the motivation behind spending this time with God. What is it that would lead a man or a woman to set aside some things in your life that might be good in order to pursue what is best? Well, I would encourage some of you to spend less time watching ESPN or less time on social media or less time um, doing any number of other hobbies in order to invest time from your life in God's Word and in prayer on a daily basis. What is it that would prompt you to push past the awkwardness of sometimes praying and, and not always feeling as if you're being heard or God's speaking back? Or, or, or what would push you past the awkwardness of maybe you're not as familiar with the Bible and so you're just getting to know it or getting comfortable with it and so there's an awkwardness you feel when you open it to read it? What would lead you to push past the awkwardness or past whatever would hold you back, whatever would inhibit you to create this healthy rhythm of a daily time with God in his word and in prayer. And I think the motivation behind that is what we're talking about today, which is, is the, the principle of, of pursuit. Of pursuit. What I want to look at, I've asked you to turn to Philippians 3, and what I want to share with you this morning are, are three understandings, if you will, that we need if we're going to maintain a healthy pursuit of God that would include this, day, this rhythm of a time with God in his word and in prayer on a regular basis. If you have your Bibles open, follow along with me then Philippians 3, and we're going to read verses 2 through 14, and we'll just sort of uh, read the whole of the passage, and then we'll come back and break it down and see these three areas. And we're going to talk about the value of Christ, about an estimate of self, about the focus of the heart. These are what are needed if we have this healthy pursuit that would motivate us to this rhythm of time with God on a regular basis. Philippians 3, begin at verse 2. Follow along with me as Paul writes these words, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, Paul writes, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. 
Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Three understandings that are needed if we're going to maintain this healthy pursuit of God that includes um, a rhythm of regular daily time with him in his word and in prayer. Again, we need to understand these three things, the value of Christ, an estimate of self, a focus of the heart. Notice, first of all, we need to understand the value of Christ. Now, if you're not familiar with this passage, when we started reading, he talks about beware of the dogs, beware of evil. Paul sounds kind of harsh. He sounds brittle. He sounds sort of, Paul is dealing with, Paul is confronting in those early verses, Paul is confronting false teachers who are in Philippi who are suggesting, in essence, a teaching, a works salvation. That faith in Christ alone was not enough, but that you, there were certain works you had to do, specifically around certain Jewish religious rituals that must be done in addition to trusting Christ that were necessary for salvation. And the reason that Paul maybe feels so strongly about this is because this is how Paul once believed. This is how Paul had once lived. Paul had given his life to, to this confidence in his own fleshly accomplishments. In fact, that's what he says here. He says, if there was anybody who had any reason to have confidence in their, in their accomplishments, in their fleshly accolades, if you will, then it would have been me. He speaks in verses 4 and 5 about his pedigree, how he, he was ritually, racially, culturally, he was as Jewish as you could be. He was, as, 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 he was unsurpassed. As in terms of his pedigree as a, as a Jewish man. In verse 6, he talks about his moral achievements, how he was a, a Pharisee. He was among the most orthodox of the Jewish people, strictly following what they understood to be the word of God. He was unparalleled in his zeal, so much so that he would chase down Christians to see them either be jailed or put to death because they were a threat to the Jewish faith in his eyes at one time. He, he had, by man's standards, he says, he had been found blameless. But when they looked at their laws and their requirements and, and at what man, from, from a man-centered perspective of the Jewish law, then when they looked at Paul's life, Paul says, I, I, I checked all the boxes. I, I, I did all the right things. I, I was above reproach. By, by the standards of religious men, Paul says, I was as, as high, I was, as, I was head and shoulders in essence above the majority of humanity. I was as good and strong and spiritual and, and godly as could, could be considered possible. And these are the things that Paul had valued. These are the things that Paul had boasted in. These are the things that Paul had pursued. These are the things that Paul had lived for. But something shifted in his life. Verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In fact, he says, more than that, I count all things. So not just these things I've listed, but everything else. To be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Twice in those verses he uses the word count. In verse 7 he talks about we count, I've counted these things as lost. Verse 8, I've counted them as rubbish. The word count there means to reckon, to consider, to look at something carefully and arrive at a conclusion. It was an accounting term that was the idea of adding up the numbers to make sure that the balance sheet comes out right. What Paul is saying is I looked at my life and when I looked at all of these things that I, that I was, the, the pedigree that I had, the achievements of my life, my, my, my spiritual uh, successes, the, the, the blamelessness before man, when I looked at all of these things and I really added it up and I really paid attention to it and I really understood it, then when I considered all these things and their ability to bring me into right standing before God, I have come to count them as loss, as in essence of no value whatsoever. When I looked at, when I considered these things and their ability to make me righteous before God, in right standing before God, to be acceptable before God, then I came to realize that they were, they were lost. They were useless. They, it doesn't add up. It, it, in fact, he says, I count them, verse 8, as rubbish. That word means refuse, waste. If I could be so blunt, manure. 
Paul says, all these things that I was valued, that I held so dear, that I thought were such a big deal, that I found my, my identity in, that I found my value in, that I found my purpose in, that I would have held it to say, look at how important and valuable I am. Paul says, I've come to see all these things are like a big pile of waste. What's really valuable, what really matters, what really counts for Paul is, is these things are nothing. He says compared to, verse 8, compared to the surpassing value of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Paul says what has brought me into a place where I can stand before God, be accepted before God, be, in, be considered righteous before God, belong to the family of God, be eternally a part of the kingdom of God, I've come to understand is not my own goodness, is not my own achievement, or not these things that I once valued. Verse 9, what, what, what I found value in is Christ, that I may be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, from me keeping the law, from what I can do, from what I can achieve, from what I can check off the list. But that righteousness that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That as I place my faith in his son Jesus, he accounts his righteousness to my account and makes me acceptable to God. So that verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He says what's valuable, what I've come to see is really valuable in life is to know Christ. I get to know God. And not just know him like a set of facts, not just know him as some historical reality, not just to know some things about Jesus from, from, from something that was written in the book, but I can know him personally and intimately. I can have relationship with him, not just to know him as a savior, but to know him as my Lord, to know him as my, 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 my king, to know God as my father, to walk and live with him experientially day by day. And as I do so, he says, I experience the power of his resurrection, the same power that raised Christ from the dead, the power of the Holy Spirit is at work, is present in every Christian in your life and in mine, transforming us, empowering us, strengthening us for life in Christ. He says we get to know the fellowship of his sufferings, that our God is so good that he can even take the hard things of life and use them to draw us to himself and to teach us more about himself than we could ever learn in the happiest of days necessarily. He says we're being conformed to his death through faith in Christ. We are dying daily to self and sin so that more and more who we are looks like Christ Jesus. In order, verse 11, that we may attain to the resurrection from the dead, that, that in Christ we have this hope. That when this life ends, we will be removed from even the very presence of sin and enter into the presence of God where we will be perfected before him. We will be made like Christ. We'll be with him forever. So do you see what Paul is saying? I have all these human accomplishments and all these accolades and, and this impressive pedigree I've looked closely at them, i examined them, I've run the numbers to see how it all balances out, and ultimately I've come to see that all of these things are a complete and utter waste, refuse, compared to the amazing privilege of knowing Jesus by faith and having his righteousness placed in my account and knowing what it is to have a relationship with him day by day. This is why Paul would write earlier in this letter, for me to live is Christ. This is my life. I came to see the value. These things I once valued are nothing. They are lost. They are rubbish. What really matters in life is that I get to know Jesus. That I get to grow and develop and mature in relationship with him day by day and moment by moment. And so, friends, when you and I understand what really matters in life, when we carefully look at all our fleshly achievements and our accolades and what they actually accomplish and compare it to what we have in Christ, the opportunity to know him more and more, to be transformed after his likeness, then it is a complete no-brainer to say no to some things in our lives if it means that we can say yes to Jesus. 
It is a, listen, if you could see truthfully the value of the stuff you are pursuing and living for and compare it to the value of knowing Christ, then it would be a complete no-brainer if you are an unbeliever today for you to, whatever price you think that you would need to pay to release these things in order to follow Christ, it would be a complete no-brainer to say, I would gladly pay that price to know Jesus. And for those of us who know the Lord, who, who have surrendered our lives to him, who would say that we are believers, it would be a no-brainer when we see the value of Christ. To say no to even some good things in our lives if it would allow us to say yes to time with the Lord and pursuing him. I don't care how many likes or, or follows or, or whatever it is that you would have on social media. Those things are rubbish compared to Christ no matter how much money you can make on your job it's rubbish compared to the value of Christ no matter how good you could get your golf score down it is loss compared to the beauty of Christ all things Paul says what what drives me in this pursuit of Jesus every day is that I've come to see the value of Jesus and it drives me to want him more and more and more What it presses Brian Kinlaw on, what it, I hope it would press you to look at is to ask ourselves if, if we value Jesus in that same way. Does it still amaze us and does it still motivate us that, that people like you and me get to know God and to walk in relationship with him day by day? What, what, what drives a pursuit that motivates this this? This rhythm of time with God, part of it is a proper value of Christ. Secondly, it's an estimate of self. In verses 12 and 13, I think it's interesting, Paul is concerned that someone might read this letter and they might think that Paul thinks that he's arrived. Like there's some level of moral or spiritual perfection where, where Paul would say, well, you know, I'm so spiritual, I'm so good, I've crossed the finish line, I'm just sort of coasting now from now until death. Do you know anybody who lives that way? You ever met someone who would identify themselves as a Christian, but who in some way, somewhere along the way, they've convinced themselves that they are so spiritual, that they have learned so much, that they have served so long, that they have reached some point in their life where they no longer need to grow, that they are super spiritual, especially when they compare themselves to others, and so they're just sort of coasting until they get to heaven. You ever met anybody like that? You ever been tempted to look in the mirror and see yourself like that? Some of you, after being a part of God's church for years, you've been through so many. Some of you have done hundreds, maybe even thousands of Bible studies at this point in your life. And you may convince yourself that you are so knowledgeable of the scriptures. Or maybe you've served in some area in the life of the church and you did it for so many years. Or maybe when you look at your life and compare it to the life of the majority of humanity in our culture today and how broken and immoral and fallen our world is and you look then in the mirror you may feel that you have spiritually arrived that there's not much more for you to learn that you that you're just sort of you, you're you, you you've got your ticket to heaven you belong to God and so you're just sort of on your way and you set your life on spiritual cruise control on the flip side there may be someone in this room and there may be someone who would watch this later who you feel like you're so hopeless that you've made some decisions in your life that are so bad so so foolish, so challenging, so painful, so, um, so wrong that you can't possibly see how God could do anything good with your life. And so you've settled for where you're at. You can't imagine any sort of abundance in a spiritual life. You can't imagine that God could do something great through you. And so you just sort of settle for your current condition. I believe that if we're going to continue a lifelong pursuit of Jesus, then it means that we have to have an accurate understanding of ourselves, of who we are and where we are in our walk with Jesus and what it is that he wants to do in us. Look at what Paul says in verse 12. Here's Paul's estimate of himself. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect. Paul says, I want to make it clear. When, when I placed my faith in Jesus, that wasn't the finish line. That wasn't the end of something. It's not like, okay, I've given my life to Christ. The righteousness of Christ has now been a 
imputed to me. I've gotten my ticket to heaven. Now I'm just going to chill out and do what I want to do from now until I get there, until I die. That's, Paul says, that's not, that's not how I see myself. That's not how I see my life. Yes, positionally, judicially, if you will, when you place your faith in Christ Jesus at the moment of your salvation, the righteousness of Jesus is accounted to you. And God accepts you not on the basis of your goodness, but on the basis of Christ's finished work. You are acceptable before God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our sins have been addressed. We have been made right with him positionally. But practically, Paul says for his life, and we know for our lives, that we still, what we are positionally and how we live practically, there's often a pretty large gap, isn't there? I've got some room to grow, and so do you. That's why Paul said in Philippians 1, 6, I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He understood there's an ongoing work that God desires to do in our hearts and in our lives. Paul knew that for himself. And so he says in verse 13, brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Paul's not complacent. He completely rejected any idea that he was now so spiritual, so moral, so good that he could just coast until he got to heaven. He also rejected any sort of hopelessness that because he had blown it so terribly in his past that somehow God couldn't do anything amazing or glorious in and through his life. Paul says instead, in both in verse 12 and verse 13, he declares that he presses on. That, that wording is the wording of pursuit. It's an aggressive, energetic endeavor. It's running or following after something, exerting yourself, sweating as you do so. Interestingly enough, it's the same word in the Greek as in verse 6 when he talked about persecuting Christians. So Paul says, the same zeal and the passion with which I once tried to chase down Christians to to imprison them and put them to death, I now place into my pursuit of, my pressing after, my seeking after Jesus and growing in my relationship with him. So Paul's not hopeless, and he's he's not hopeless, he's not complacent. He's not disheartened, and he's not satisfied. He knew that he was not yet fully like the Lord and and that he never would be this side of heaven. He also knew, though, that there was resurrection power at work in him to transform him so that he, he can become more and would become, be transformed more and more like Christ. And so Paul says, I I give my energy, I've given my life to follow after Jesus with energy and passion so that more and more the man he was would be a reflection of Jesus. Again, I say this respectfully because um, I think all of us can go through seasons like this in our lives. But some of you have probably become complacent. My guess is that there are some of us in this room who have settled. We would never say it out loud because we know that if, once we hear it, then we would know how foolish it sounds. But, but at some level, we feel like we've arrived. And perhaps you're resting on your past accomplishments, your past accolades again you look around at others and you look at yourself and feel that you're better than you really are and 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 that that reality is reflected for some of us in the absence of that committed time to be with Jesus each day you say well Brian where's that corollary come from well if you really thought you needed to hear from God each day if you really thought you needed wisdom from God each day if you really thought that you needed to share your heart with God each day if you really thought and understood that God wanted to hear from you each day, if you really believed that that was important, if you really saw that there was still room for growth, if you really believed that there was still more that God wanted to do in and through your life, then wouldn't you prioritize time in his word and in prayer with him? And if those aren't priorities in my heart and in my life, wouldn't that be an indication that somewhere along the way I have settled, I have become complacent, I have, I have sort of settled for a base level of, of my relationship with Jesus instead of, as Paul says, pressing on, pursuing? Or maybe for you, again, it's that hopelessness that you think there's just not much hope for you to look like Jesus, and so you just sort of settle for your life as it currently is. You can't imagine the the whole talk of the abundant life in Christ sounds like a a farce to you. It sounds uh, mythical to you. It sounds like something that other people may experience, but you could never have. To say it as clearly as I can, friends, none of us have arrived None of us are so spiritual, so moral, so religious, so good that there's not room for growth and maturity and work that God wants to do in us. 
And at the same time, none of you are so hopeless. None of us are so hopeless that somehow anything that you've done could be so grave, so damaging, so sinful, so marred that God would have to write you off and say, There's no, I can't do anything else with you. What I, as I was studying, and this has been a few weeks ago, and really in writing this, this message, and, but as I've been thinking even more and more as I, uh, in writing and thinking and preparing to share with us this morning, what, what I sense is that God is, is seeking to stir within my heart is a holy dissatisfaction, a discontentment in the appropriate way. And maybe... Maybe you would need to join me in a prayer that would say something like this to God. God, help me to see my life through your eyes. To see both my need and my potential for growth in Christ by your power. God, help me have a clear, proper, accurate estimate of myself that encourages me to daily pursue you. God, give me a holy dissatisfaction. So what is it that would provoke a daily pursuit of God? We need to understand the value of Christ. We need to understand and have a proper estimate of self. But then notice also, then thirdly, we need to understand the focus of the heart. Because Paul valued Christ above all accolades and accomplishments, because he knew he still had room to grow, he had not yet arrived. He had been walking with Jesus for 30 years, but he still knew that he was not yet fully the man that God desired for him to be. Then notice the singularity of his focus again in verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God, In Christ Jesus. One thing. Verse 14, he says, I press on. That's present tense, ongoing, continuous, a lifelong pursuit for Paul. Paul says, I now have this singular focus of the heart, this one driving thing in my life. This is what drives me, Paul is saying. Let me ask you this morning, what drives you? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited about life? What stirs your heart and moves you to action? What is it that that gets your blood pumping and gets you energized and and advancing? What, What is it that moves your life? Paul says, here's what it is for me. Forgetting what lies behind. I'm not, I'm not paralyzed by the past, whether my, uh, my accomplishments or, uh, or my failures. Today's a new day, a new adventure, a new moment, a fresh start. Some of you, there are some things you need to forget if you want to press ahead, if we're just honest. For all of us, right? Forgetting what's behind and reaching toward. And that's the word in here is for, again, for the athletic games of sort of with all of their might. At the very end of the race when the runner is pokes the chest out and runs with all their might to cross the finish line first. That's the word in here. Uh, and reaching forward with all, straining my muscles with all I've got to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not going to look back, and I'm not going to look to the side, and I'm not going to lose my stride, and I'm not going to lose speed. I've got one singular focus, Paul says. Because I've understood the value of Christ, because I see the estimate of who and what I really am, and I see there's still room to grow. I've got one singular drive. And what is that prize? What is that goal? Verse 12, that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And why did Christ Jesus lay hold of us? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 8, 29, those he foreknew he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Paul says the goal for which God saved me and brought me into his family is the goal that I am living for and the focus and the drive of my life every day. And it is singular and it is this. To make me like Jesus. And you may say, hey, that's great for Paul. Paul was an amazing man. Paul had quite the pedigree. Paul saw great things. Paul was used mildly by God. Paul went on missionary trips. Paul, I mean, Paul, yes, to become like Jesus. But but you or me, 
Again, Romans 8, 29, doesn't, Paul doesn't say this, that, that he foreknew me and he predestined. No, he says, for those, whoever he foreknew and those he, predest- those he worked in, those who he, he drew to himself, those who have been saved through faith in Christ, he says, have been conformed. You, me, God's purpose for us, God's goal for your life is so much bigger than making you healthy and wealthy It's so much bigger than than making you popular and powerful. The goal, the aim, the purpose of God for you, the, the prize for which we pursue is to know Christ and in knowing him that we are being made like him. You and I are being transformed to be like Jesus. So that I think like Jesus thinks that I treat others like Jesus would treat others, that I hate sin in the same way that Jesus would hate sin, that I love the Father in the same way that Jesus loved the Father, that more and more, I'm not talking about physical appearance, I'm not talking about growing a beard and wearing sandals, but that more and more when you look at and observe the life of Brian Kinlaw or your life, that what others would see and what you would see is more and more and more of Jesus. Paul says, this is my focus, and maybe we would be willing, man, would, what a difference it could make. What a difference it would make at Woodland Park. What a difference it would make in your family scenario. What a difference it would make in your workplace. What a difference it would make in your personal life. If you and I would come to the place of saying, God, do whatever you need to do in my life, that I would cooperate and surrender to you so that I might be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus. Lord, give me a passion to be like you. Lord, give me a singular focus and desire and passion to be like you. Whatever else you desire, whatever else you're pursuing, whatever else drives your life, every other pursuit is secondary to this one because it is God's ultimate plan for you to make you like Jesus. And among the tools that he uses to do that is to establish those rhythms where we engage with God in his word and in prayer and allowing the spirit of God to do his work in us. So hear me, this is not Let go and let God. This is not like passive yielding. God, I'm just going to stand back and you just do your work in me magically some some way. And at the same time, it's not grit your teeth and try harder. I'm going to get through these five chapters of the Bible this morning if it kills me. If I don't remember a single word, I'm going to read it. Yes, and check it off on my box. But Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a, there's a part that we play. Then he says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You cannot transform yourself. You cannot make yourself more like Jesus. Our confidence is not in ourselves and in our abilities. But God has sent, the Father has sent his Son, and Jesus in return to heaven has sent his Spirit to dwell within us to enable our experience of victory, of growth in our lives. We play our part as we surrender to him and align with him and get in the flow of what it is that he wants to say to us and what he wants to do in our lives. And as we surrender to him and to his means of grace, his word, prayer, that he does his transformative work so that more and more who you are can look like who Jesus is. Friends, I'm telling you, as I've been thinking and praying all this week, and even as I was driving in this morning, I want you to hear that the heart of the elders of the leadership of this church, I believe the heart of every small group leader, the heart of every person working with students, children, adults at Woodland Park, I pray is this. And what we want for you more than anything is not just to put your name on Woodland Park's role. It's not just that you would give so we would have more money. It's not just that you would show up so we have more, more uh, people in the seats. Our heart for you is that you would be made like Christ. This is what you were made for. And so we're inviting you on this journey with us that over these next six weeks, 
We would establish this rhythm of a daily time with God. And again, we're making this book available to you as a resource to help you do that. If you say, Brian, I'm looking at that and that's way too intimidating. One, it's really not. It looks bigger than it is. There's daily readings. It's very it's simple and yet profound and powerful. And I, I would encourage you to utilize it. But if, if you can't do that or if you have something you're already doing, fine. Then you do what you're doing that would in, encourage you, that would enable you to spend time daily reading from God's word and then time in prayer and 40 days, again, there's something significant about that in God's Word, but also research shows that if you do something over 40 days, you'll help develop a habit in your life that then will carry you over into the weeks and the months ahead. But the reason behind it, the motivation for you to do it is not just, well, I'm going to do it because Willem Park's wanting us to do this. It is that what should drive us is that you've looked at life and realized that anything else, all your other human accomplishments, all your other pursuits are nothing compared to the value of what's available in Christ Jesus. That you've looked in the mirror and you've realized that you're not too hopeless for God to do a work in you, but you also aren't so super spiritual that you don't need a greater transformative work in your life between now and arriving home in heaven. And it should be driven by this, this singular goal, this passionate pursuit and focus that above all else, says, I want to be like Christ. And so with our heads bowed and our eyes closed for just a moment, there, it's possible that someone in this room today is where Paul was at the outset, and maybe you've been trusting in other things or other accomplishments or your own morality, your own goodness, to make you acceptable to God. And maybe God again today in his grace is revealing yet one more time. You'll never be good enough. You can never be spiritual enough, righteous enough, good enough. In your own strength and your own ability to breach the distance that exists between you and your brokenness and God and his perfection. You can't do it. But here's the good news. God so loved you that he bridged that gap for us in his son, Jesus. And if you've never surrendered your life to him, then here this morning, here now, here in this space, here in this quiet moment, I would beg of you, whatever calls you'd say, well, man, to follow Jesus, there's some things I'd have to give up. Listen, it's all rubbish. It's all manure. It's all waste. It's all loss compared to to all that is available to you in Christ. And maybe today would be the day that for somebody in this room, just right where you're seated, you would just call out to Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe that you paid the price for my sin on the cross so that your righteousness, your perfection could be placed upon my account through faith. And so Jesus, today I put my faith in you. I trust you. I surrender my life to you as my Savior and Lord. If God's stirring your heart to do that, do that now. But my prayer for all of us, both individually and then collectively as a body of believers, is that we would together say, Lord, I surrender anew to you. God, give me a holy discontent with my current, um, where I currently am in my, my Christ-likeness. I'm thankful for all that you have done and are doing in my life, but I recognize today that I haven't arrived there's still much to be done. So Jesus, today I, I surrender afresh to you and to your work in me. Maybe today that surrender for you would look like maybe you've begun to pursue lots of other things and maybe you would renew your singular focus of, of Christ-likeness. Maybe today you felt hopeless and today you would see that God says, no matter what you've done, my arms are open wide, come back surrender afresh to me and I will do a great work in you. Maybe you have felt super spiritual and it's revealed in the fact that you don't pursue God. You don't spend time with him because you think that you're okay and you don't need him. And maybe today you would say, God, create within me that dissatisfaction, that longing afresh for you because I need you. I want your work in me. And in the moment, we're going to declare through song our response to the Lord. But as we do so, we also, as we pray, invite you. And whether it's there in your seat, if you want to lift your hands and surrender to the Lord, if you want to come to the front 
and kneel and surrender to him. If you want to turn your seat there into an altar and turn around and kneel before the Lord and ask for him to create within you a, a new dissatisfaction, a, 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 a holy discontent. If you want to commit today, God, I don't know, but with your help and in your strength for the next, these days, I'm going to, at least this week, I'll start today spending this time with you in your word and in prayer. It may be imperfect, but God, by your strength and in your power, I want to do this because I want to grow in your likeness. Whatever it is that God is stirring in your heart of surrender this morning as a man or a woman of God, then in these moments, Jesus, would you have your way among us? Spirit of God, whatever you're wanting to do in our hearts right now, would you draw us to a holy dissatisfaction, to value Christ so that we pursue you, to see ourselves rightly, to be singular in focus, to long above all else to be made after the likeness of your son Jesus, knowing that you will do that work as we yield to you. God, stir surrender in our hearts today, here, now.